us and we'll start. Oh, great. Yeah. Great. Okay. We will get going. Wonderful. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm just so happy to see all of you and so thrilled to be here as well with Chef Cola. Today is day nine of the 15 day global plant rich diet challenge. My name is Andrea Wotan and I'm a member of the SRAG plant rich diet task force. We've worked very hard to find excellent speakers to provide information supporting our journey. And today is no exception as I am pleased and honored to welcome all of you and our speaker, Nicola Kagoro. Nicola Kagoro, otherwise known as Chef Cola, is a pioneering female Zimbabwean vegan chef at the helm of African Vegan on a Budget. Founded in 2016, African Vegan on a Budget was developed to showcase Chef Cola's cuisine and culinary development, as well as to actively promote the reality that people can thrive on a healthy vegan and plant-based diet on a budget. Chef Cola also works with the International Anti-Poaching Foundation, IAPF.org, and Akashinga Back to Black Roots, a pioneering vegan conservation program front consisting entirely of female rangers. Uh, Akashinga is a scalable, community-driven conservation model empowering disadvantaged women to restore and manage a network of wilderness areas as an alternative to trophy hunting. The program is vegan and is a vehicle for building strong, respected ambassadors to drive a plant-based movement from the community level of rural Africa. Chef Cola serves as executive chef and project manager for the kitchen, preparing entirely vegan meals and ration packs for the female anti-poaching ranger force. And I would just love to mention that Chef Cola was featured in a recent uh, Forbes article titled The Entrepreneur, Chef on a Mission to Protect the Planet. And I highly recommend reading through that, that wonderful article. So we are so honored, so, so honored to have Chef Cola with us, to meet her this evening, to have a chance to talk with her and learn from her experience. And uh, Chef Cola was kind enough to pre-record a presentation for us. So I am going to show that presentation first. And, and then we have um, a special trailer about the Akashinga Ranger, Rangers that she supports through her culinary skills that we'll show afterward before jumping into the Q&A with Chef Cola. So I will share my screen and just give me a moment. Yeah. Okay, oops. Give me one second. Just have to make sure I have it up here. All right. All right, everybody, enjoy. Hi, everybody. My name is Nicola Kagoro, also known as Chef Cola, and I am the founder of African Vegan on a Budget, which is a plant based brand that was founded in 2016. And we are established in Cape Town, South Africa, and Harare, Zimbabwe, in my hometown. Zimbabwe, that's where I come from. I just want to give you a little bit of a background about who I am and how my vegan plant-based journey started in general. So I'm 32 and I went to college in Cape Town in 2011, about a couple of years ago, almost a decade. I studied hospitality management and during my three-year um, course with the International Hotel School in Cape Town, I discovered that 
I actually have a passion for cooking. So one of the requirements for us to graduate from hospitality management school was for us to basically go study, find an internship for six months in any hotel, any department in a hotel, um, and just make sure that you get your own job, make sure that you get paid, and come back after six months and then do another six months and then you graduate. So a little bit backwards, during the three years that I was at the International Hotel School, I had a 10 week practical period where I was in the kitchen, going to the kitchen in a five star hotel, various five star hotels for about three months and I found out that I actually have a passion for cooking. So when my third year hit, I decided that instead of going into the housekeeping department or the front office department or any other department, I decided to go into the kitchen department. I found a, um, a job placement at a small restaurant, small cafe rather, at that time that was called Plant, Plant Cafe in Cape Town. I worked my way up from scullery, which is washing the dishes, um, chopping and doing all the random odd jobs that you need to do to be a part of the, the, the kitchen. And I started stealing with my eyes. One of the one of the best pieces of advice that I got from chefs, um, which are traditional chefs, is that you steal with your eyes. So if someone tells you to go and wash dishes, you wash dishes, make sure that they're clean, but then looking backwards, looking at what the chef is doing, um, trying to make sure, okay, this is how they chop their vegetables, this is what they're doing to clean them, this is what happens when an order is, um, comes in ETC. So when I got the job at Fan Cafe, I was working scullery and I was stealing with my eyes a lot. And one day, the, a lot of things happened within the kitchen and the sous chef had to leave and the head chef had to go on a, there's a dog festival in Japan that was happening and she had to go there for about six months and she told me, okay, we've seen you, you, you work hard, why don't you take the position? They gave me a write-up about everything that I need to do while she's away. I busted my myself off and I worked so hard that Fast forward within a couple of months, the chef that trained me had to advance onto other things within her life. So she, I became the head chef of that small cafe. That small cafe became Plant, which is now one of the the founding um, restaurants, plant-based restaurants in Cape Town. And that's how I started my vegan journey. After working at Plant for about four years, I started African Vegan on a Budget because I realized that in my home city, my home country, the veganism was something that wasn't really being explored and it was something that needed to, it, it needed a, a voice. So I was one of the, the founders of the vegan movement within Zimbabwe a couple of years ago when I started um, African Vegan on a Budget. So. After I left my full-time position as an executive chef in Cape Town and founded African Vegan on a Budget, I asked myself the question, why am I spreading the vegan movement to people within Africa, to people within Zimbabwe and Cape Town? And I realized that veganism is not something that's just about the animals and also environment. And it's, that's very important that we um, veganism is a voice for animals, veganism is a voice for the environment. But then one thing that I saw within my own community was that we didn't have a voice for our people. And I kind of, not kind of, I created that veganism is something that my ancestors were living um, within Africa. And I believe that um, plant-based diets and vegan diets were there during um, my ancestral periods and that's why I always say that veganism originated in Africa. Yes, we used to eat meat. I'm not saying that my ancestors didn't eat meat, but what I'm saying is that not to um, 
go too deep into history because I'm not a historian. Um, I'm saying that why I say veganism originated in Africa is because our ancestors respected our animals. We used to speak to our animals. We used to only kill them when we were, um, for example, having celebrating the birth. Um, there was a wedding, there was a death. Um, Rainmakers, spiritual healers would have to make sacrificial, sacrificial benef um, benefits, etc. So, and when we did kill these animals, we wouldn't just slaughter the whole herd of animals. We'll just choose one, prey upon it, and then that animal we wouldn't eat at one time. We would um, use drying methods and preserve that animal. Um, and it was also a sense of respect, given that animal a sense of respect. And why I say veganism originated, the plant-based diets originated in Africa, is because these are the practices that we used to practice. And through unfortunate colonial um, practices, not to delve into too much into history, through unfortunate colonial practices where taught nasty meat eating habits, um, those equate to um, for example, having sheep, having cows or pigs, herding them, chickens, herding them in mass production so that our colonial rulers could um, take them elsewhere. It wasn't for our benefit. So that's when that notion of meat equals wealth came into our, our, our bloodline, our system. And now, when we say meat equals wealth, you have to understand why people say that. It's because we're trying to police people who had their beliefs on us. So, I was in Cape Town, and this is when Damien Lander, the founder of the International Anti-Culture Foundation, contacted me. And it's funny story how I met Mr. Lander. He had a reporter come onto the campsite and was reporting about the rangers. And as you all know, the Akashinka rangers are the world's only currently and first. So we still hold the title. We've been holding the title for about five years. They're the only well, they're the world's first only armed female rangers. A little bit of a tongue twister. So they're armed. They're vegan and they're female. And that's the only ranger site that you find anywhere in the world, not just Africa. So a reporter came to do a piece on the Akashinga Rangers and that reporter happened to ask Mr. Amanda like, okay, how come Chef Kobe is not a part of this um, this movement that you guys are doing? Because she had asked him, how come there's no vegan chefs on the site? And he said that I don't know any vegan chefs in Zimbabwe in Harare. And she was just like, I guess you don't know about Chef Coleman. And if you know Mr. Amanda, he's one of those people who, if he doesn't know something, he's gonna find out about it and he's gonna be in tune with it. And he found out about me and I was in Cape Town working with um, a cancer patient at that time who decided to go on a plant-based diet. And she was working with her doctors and working with me. So I was cooking all of her meals, breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, everything for about a year. And to the point where um, the doctors actually, she had breast, breast cancer and now she's still um, doing well. And I'm actually grateful for that. So I was working with her and she's still on a vegan plant-based diet till now. So Damien phoned me and he was just like, why don't you come and see my camp? He flew me out from Cape Town and I went to go see his camp and I discovered that at that time there were only 80 female rangers um, who were working with them and they were not they, they didn't, they had a chef on site, but then the chef wasn't really a chef. There wasn't any structure. And what were, what they were doing is that they would buy food from the local suppliers, local markets, local supermarkets, and um, they would cook their own food. But there had to be a more formal structure, which is building a formal kitchen, having menus, having a structure when we buy food, when we resupply, which supplies we're using, from which communities, what we're supporting, having gardens, things like that. So I came into um, Agashinga 
and I met them. I studied the current system and I fell in love with the program and we decided to name the, the kitchen Bad to Black Roots. Why we named it Bad to Black Roots is because we believe veganism started in Africa and we're going back to our roots and also why the kitchen is vegan and we're into anti-culture is that we believe that it's very contradictive to go out and support animals, protect the animals, and then come back and eat an animal. Whether it be the cow, a pig, a chicken, whether you're protecting a lion, a, a hyena, an elephant, you, it's very contradictive. So we decided to make the whole program 100% plant-based and vegan. So that's when I came in with my expertise, working, being trained in Cape Town, and working with different people, establishing African Vegan on the Budget. Me and Miss Amanda collaborated and we developed the Back to Black Roots Kitchen. And today's when, actually not today's, when the kitchen started, we had two chefs. Um, one female, which was a young lady, Chef Judith, uh, she used to actually sell hot chips to truck drivers on the side of the road. Um, we operate in the Zambezi Valley area, which is close to Zambezi and Zimbabwe. So there's a lot of truck driver movement that happens. So she used to set up shop and from midnight selling hot chips up until the early morning, just trying to make a living. So I heard about her, took her under the kitchen's wing and started training her. And then there was a, a gentleman who we call Mr. James. He used to actually work on the, the concession, the hunting concession that we actually protect now. And as a hunter and a skinner, for, he actually used to hunt the elephants, come skin them, chop up the animals, which is very bad. But now the irony of it is that Mr. James is now one of the head chefs for the same concession, but it's now plant-based. He doesn't even hunt or kill. And over the years, the, we grew the kitchen because the rangers grew from 80, now we have 200 plus rangers. So we have an umbrella, I am the executive chef, and then I have a team of 10 chefs that work with me. Four are male, four are male, and then the rest are female. Um, we, our responsibility is to provide three course, no, three meals that are vegan every single day and snacks, whatever it be that the rangers need. Basically, we, we fill the rangers so that they can do the job that they need to do. We also make sure that when they go out to something that we call extended patrol, which is going out into the, into the bush for days, weeks on end, just staying in the middle of nowhere, um, we make sure that they have food. So obviously, you can't take a stove, they can't take a stove, they can't, use a lot of things so we make sure that they have the right nutrients um, that are vegan so that they can survive in the bush for extended days that's why we, we call it extended patrol and on top of that the black to black roots kitchen is responsible for doing community development we are very big on community development in the areas that we operate in order to play our parts in the kitchen we do things such as supporting the local we have our own garden that we grow um, vegetables and fruit that are um, that can be grown in the very hostile conditions that we operate in. But we also support the local community. Um, if someone is growing carrots, peas, onions, tomatoes, whatever, um, and we don't have enough to resupply that day, and maybe an, another operation is happening in a different department, like a. Um, not to say too much, maybe an, another operation is happening and the vehicle can't be used, therefore we can't go to the, the nearest community, the nearest supermarket um, to get groceries. We use local communities, um, people who grow their own vegetables, their own gardens, and that's how we support our community development. We also do um, human community development. Right now the Back to Back Roots Kitchen is working with a young lady her name is Kuku, and she has um, facial cancer. Unfortunately, um, we've been working with her for the past three years, whereby um, the International anti poultry Foundation is facilitating that her facial cancer is being treated and healed. We did a GoFundMe 
whereby we managed to raise 5,000 US dollars um, for Kumbu and now we are planning to do another GoFundMe um, because the first initial GoFundMe, I'm going to put the pictures up and you'll see who I'm speaking about. The first initial GoFundMe was for her to get the injections to remove, um, to sort of shrink the growth. Now that the growth is being um, shrunk and the doctor has said that um, we now need to, we can, we can now manage to remove the growth. And the good thing about Zimbabwe now is that we have beautiful medical doctors who are willing to do these um, practices for free. Um, I guess to say doctors beyond borders. And um, that's one thing that we're going to facilitate. So her, her operation is scheduled for April next year and we have to do we're trying to facilitate we're trying to facilitate that her operation happens next year in April, but then she has aftercare treatment that's probably gonna cost another five thousand. So all in all we're trying to we're all about community development. We're all about spreading the message of why veganism is important. We're going back to our roots and also we're all about female empowerment. I am under a grant that's called Pro Veg Grant, and under that grant, I run a series of kitchens within Africa. And right now, our first kitchen is based in Furi in Zimbabwe. And we have a uh, so basically, the thing is that I'm so excited when I speak about it. I've adopted 60 children, 60 to 80 children, and we teach them plant based vegan movements. So when I say plant-based vegan movement, we have gardens, we have cooking lessons, we have mentorship programs, after-school programs, and we even go into their schools. And it's under the ProVent grant, and that's one of the main things that I love doing, which is community development again, and which is about spreading the plant-based movement within Africa, especially, and maybe one day we'll go global. So yeah, so shout out to all my 80 children. So one thing that a lot of people ask is how did the, the female majors react to being on a vegan diet? Because a lot of people say obviously they weren't vegan when they started. Um, it was really, <laughs> it was a hard process. I actually got laughed at, it was really even, I cooked foods that I thought that they were going to enjoy. And I made the mistake of cooking food that I thought they, that they were going to enjoy, but not indigenous food. So when we say going back to our roots, it means being indigenous. Using um, dishes and products that are indigenous and are plant-based and vegan. So when I realized that they weren't really comfortable with um, the food that I was given, for example, uh, black eyed peas compared to um, just beans. They didn't like the flavor of black eyed peas, they didn't like the flavor of chick peas, but then they liked beans, um, just sugar beans, they like sugar beans, and these are things that have grown in our community that they like, that, that, that they understand, that are part of our diet. So when I took out the fancy vegan diets that they were used to, I realized that, okay, this makes sense, this is what we have to do. Um, and then I also realized that in these communities, that in this community that I was operating in, a lot of these, um, not even a lot, all of these rangers are living on plant-based diets whether they like it or not because again, we have this culture of saying that meat equals well. So now we're operating in rural Africa, we don't have electricity, we don't have um, things like that, we don't have fridges. So, and we don't have the luxury of, even if we have one or two chickens roaming around, one or two goats and pigs or whatever, you're not gonna slaughter them every day because we just don't do that. So, now I realize that they were even something called soy, soy chunks, and they used to call it nyama. But then there is actually soy chunks, and nyama in Zimbabwe means meat. So they were, in their head, they thought that they were eating meat, and they called it nyama, meat, out loud, so that meat equals pulp. It's a psychological thing, and I realized like, no, a lot of people in the rural communities are not eating meat, and because they can't afford it, and we don't have the fridges, and we don't have the facilities, 
And then I operate in the rural communities and I operate in urban communities. And I realize that even in the urban communities, people are not eating meat as much as they say that they're eating meat because they can't afford meat. It's a, it's a, lux a luxurious habit. So I discovered ways to make my African vegan on a budget dishes more indigenous, make them more tasty, more relatable to our culture, and also use dishes that use dishes and ingredients that uh, that everyone around the globe can relate to. Because not to say that that someone comes from a real rural community that they don't have a a versatile palate or a taste, but they like to taste different foods, but then you have to be creative and in, in how you introduce these foods to the people that you try to cook the foods to. So that's how the Black to Black Roots Kitchen started with me and Mr. Mather. That's how they found me. That's my journey as um, Nicola Kagura, Chef Cola. And I can't wait to do more within Africa and within the plant-based rural communities and urban communities. Right now, African Vegan on a Budget, you can find it anywhere on social media. We are focused on doing things called um, Dinner with Chef Cola, which is a series of dinners that are plant-based that I do in Cape Town and Zimbabwe. And I'm planning to go to Kenya, I'm planning to go to Dubai, other a lot of places and just introduce plant-based diets to people who are not plant-based and plant-based. Um, I plan on continuing to work with the International Anti-Culture Foundation growing our plant to plant kitchen. We have so much more to do. We only have 10 chefs now. We plan on being a vegan army, the top vegan um, kitchen and garden within Africa. Um, that's what we're doing. And I just wanted to say thank you for taking the time to listen to my plant-based journey. And yeah, now I'm going to open the floor for any questions because you're going to see me live. Okay. Bye. I can't believe what a wonderful video that was. And do we still have Chef Cola? I don't see her yeah, here. Yeah, she's here. Is she here? Oh, there she is. Yes, yeah. Chef Cola, that was just amazing. Absolutely beautiful story. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you know, I, I think some of us have heard this. I'm just going to reiterate that it's not data and facts that change the world and change hearts and change minds. It is personal stories that change people. And I want to tell you that I, I am so moved by your story and want to thank you so much for, for producing that beautiful story for us. Um, we've had some more people. Yeah, thank you. Um, welcome to more people. So great to see you, Joji. Thank you for joining. Hello, Shali, Avi, Jessica. Um, now I, I have another video that I'd like to show all of you. It's the trailer um, to the movie that was actually produced about the Akashinga Rangers. And just give me a moment to bring that up. Um, National Geographic worked with James Cameron and um, uh, Damien Mander to produce a 13 minute documentary film about the Akashinga Rangers, Rangers which is available for free. And um, Anju may have put the website in the chat. It's on the National Geographic website. I would highly recommend it. We'll just watch the trailer here. So you can learn more about the Akashinga Rangers. Yep, both the links are in the chat, the African Vegan on a Budget, um, the Facebook page, and then also the National Geographic Akashinga um, page. Thank you so much, Andrew. Okay, here we go. All right. I got to use my skills and training to protect these animals, to protect this land. I'm prepared to give my life. What just 
they kill elephants, they want the ivory. We're going to be up against armed men. They will kill anybody standing in their way. The only thing standing in their way will be you. We started this with 16 women. 240 more women will become rangers in the next 12 months. I love my elephants like my children. From seeing the most powerful force in nature, that's a woman's instinct to protect. I will teach you to fight. I will teach you to disappear. I will teach you to use your power. This is my duty. This is my duty. I am a brave one. Wonderful. So now we all have a wonderful overview of Chef Kola's background and what she, the wonderful work she's doing in the world. We know who the Akashinga Rangers are. So I would love to move into a Q&A and invite everyone to ask your questions of Chef Kola. And you can put questions in the chat box or you can raise your hand or you can just blurt them out, whatever you would like to do. And we will start with Scott Nelson. Okay, thank you, Andrea. And Chef Cola, I just have to say that as I was listening to you, I thought, what a well-spoken person. Uh, that was an amazing presentation. And it was so broad. You covered so many areas. Um, and I can't even begin to list them. I, I have more of a comment than a question. We are a rotary action group. And when I was at one of our international conferences, walking around the house of friendship, there was a rotary action group there that was for the big animals, the African animals. They were advocating for the animals. And when I suggested to them that a plant-rich diet, <clears throat> In other words, the whole idea that people would just stop killing and eating animals might help save the large African animals. They looked at me like I was the man on the moon. <laughs> and so, like you said earlier, people think you're crazy, you know. And so, you know, little by little, maybe they'll get it. You know, they'll sort of figure out the connection. So, and, and of course, you stated that so uh, directly uh, in your recorded talk. Thank you so much. That's more of a comment than a question, but if you have any response uh, to that, then I'd be happy to hear it. Um, thank you. Thank you for actually appreciating it. Like, you have an idea. Thank you. I have a question in terms of uh, Chef Kala. How, how do you... Uh, it's, you know, what percentage of your time is spent? Uh, it seems like you're doing so many different things and that you're so busy. I was just curious as to how much of your time are you spending working with the Rangers or and how much of your time, you know, working with trying to introduce people in the urban areas to, um, to veganism? How does, how does that work? It seems like that must be a tremendous uh, draw on your time to be involved in all of these uh, activities. Um, all right, so with the IPF organization, I started working with them in 2017. And at that time, I only had two chefs, and now we have 10. Wow. Um, so it's through trusting my team and training them properly um, to understand that this is how a, a kitchen operates because you have to remember that these chefs are not coming from um, a skilled background. Um, you're literally training them to become chefs. Um, you're literally training them to become rangers. Um, the female rangers come from backgrounds of prostitution, of um, just doing whatever it takes to survive in rural Africa. The chefs also the same. So. It, 
having that trust working with them since 2017, 18, 19, 20, 21, I managed to build a very solid team whereby when COVID hits um, the global the global pandemic, I couldn't even go see my chefs. No one was able to travel. And worse in Africa, we didn't have the resources. By the time everyone got the vaccine or knew that this thing is real, you need to take back the vaccine or whatever. We weren't doing that yet and we couldn't travel. All our country did was shut down everything. You're not allowed to move, you must stay inside, but no one has given us answers. So that's when I saw that the three years of training, the three years of time that I did manage to have with the Rangers, they actually learned something from me. And when the country got shut down, I felt like I need to do more because the Rangers are okay, they're under a foundation. What about the people who don't have foundation money? What are they doing? Um, what's happening in the rural communities? Even if they're meat eating people or non meat and eat eating people. And that's when I got lucky when ProVeg um, approached me and they're like, okay, we want to give you a small change of money every couple of months and create a program that you're just going to do throughout Harare and Zimbabwe and take it internationally. So finding the time to do things, um, honestly, I didn't have a choice but to find the time. And the key to that is starting the machine, making sure it's running and then going somewhere else and creating, if it's not, if it's working, it's not broken. So don't try to fix it. And I just took the blueprints um, from what I was doing from IPF and I just started putting it everywhere else in Africa. Um, not, not in Africa, in Harare, Zimbabwe right now. And I'm proud to say on my own, I now have 80 to 100 people that are on a vegan diet in rural Zimbabwe. Oh, um, with IPF, um, they, we have about 500 people, 500 rangers. So it's just about finding the time. I don't know why, I don't know how to answer that question, honestly. <laughs> no, I think you just did. Thank you very much. I think that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Maya, you have a question. Thank you, Andrea. Um, Chef Kola, I'm very impressed with, with your organizational skills, as you say, managing all these different activities. Um, I am a member also of ESRAC, but of the Clean Cook Stoves uh, Task Force. And of course, my question goes towards how do you do your cooking? What kind of stove do you use? And what fuel do you use? Um, do you mean? We use mainly firewood um, because I work in a lot of rural communities. As much as we want to use electricity, we don't have electricity. Um, as much as we want to use gas half of the time, people can only fill their gas canisters once a month. And then that's just that. Um, so we learn how to cook on firewood mainly. And if we really have to rely on it, it's gas. And we're just trying to find indigenous traditional methods of cooking. So even trying to cook bread in the ground, like putting it in the ground, building a, uh, an oven in the ground, those are traditional methods that can be found in Europe, in America, Africa, Asia. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm. Um that sounds very familiar to me because I run a number of projects in, in Uganda and that is also in the rural areas. And one of the things I promote there is, is the building of um, mud, cook, mud cook stoves from uh, free local materials. I don't know if you have come across these mud stoves because they do save a lot of firewood as opposed to the three stone open fires. I'm actually going to look into that. I'm actually trying to find my pen to um, match cooking stoves. Ma yes, I, if, you, if you leave your, your email in the chat box, I can send you some information because these stoves will save two thirds of firewood. So you're doing something okay. really good for the environment. And also they reduce the amount of smoke that 
people inhale, that the cooks inhale, especially if they're cooking inside. Oh, thank you for that. Thank you. Oh, okay. And, and my other question, if I may also ask you, is uh, in your gardens uh, where you grow yeah. the vegetables, what kind of um, methods do you use? Do you use um, fertilizers? What kind of pesticides? Uh, do you use organic methods? Um, we try not to use any pesticides. We try to keep it as organic as possible. So for example, I'm not quite sure on the term that it is, but then there's some, um, if, if mint grows next to a certain plant, then it grows better. They're like sister and brother. And they also um, get rid of, for example, if you grow mint and garlic around your yard, you won't get a lot of snakes. And we sure. do that a lot around camp. So. We try not to use any pesticides, try to keep it natural. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't make sense to use pesticides just as much as it doesn't make sense to go protect the animals and then come back and eat a piece of steak. So yeah, we try <laughs> to keep it as clean as possible. Yeah. <laughs> uh, excellent. I'm so pleased to hear that because that is exactly also what the farmers that I've worked with in Uganda are doing. And even if they do need uh, to to get rid of of pests, they use organic organically produced uh, mixtures that they make themselves. So I think we yeah. should uh, stay in contact after this. Definitely, thank you. Thank definitely, you. definitely. Maya, please find um, Chef Cola's email in the chat. Thank I'm you. so happy to know that you two will be in touch. Uh, on to hi. Hi, Chef Cola. Thank you again so much for everything you're doing. You know, just to echo Andrea and Scott, we're just so honored to have you here and you're, you're creating such a meaningful impact. So, uh, you know, we're just so lucky to have you. Um, my question is more related to, you know, those, the people that are the non, the, the non-believers, you know, um, of the vegan movement, the people that, you know, say that, that you say, you know, kind of, like they do here, you know, laugh at us or kind of, you know, just uh, it's say it's not possible. What, um, what do you do or what, how do you convince them to sort of change that mentality, you know, kind of going forward? What kind of, what do you use to do that? I'd be curious to know. <laughs> um, so when I started African Vegan on a Budget, I, and I still do, I run a series of dinners called Dinners with Chef Cola. And basically in 2017, the whole aim with those dinners was to invite vegans and non-vegans and to make people aware about the plant-based vegan diet. A lot of people, I used to charge my dinners literally one US dollar and I was serving a six course um, vegan meal uh, with a trained vegan chef from Cape Town and people would laugh at me and just basically just come and then talk smack about it. Then I, I continued to continue to do those dinners until one day BBC um, contacted me, um, BBC International, and they're like, we want to fly out. Um, it was this year in February. We want to fly out and film your dinners. And that's when people started, um, for lack of a better phrase, giving respect towards the dinners. And once they saw me being recognized internationally in places like Forbes, BBC, National Geographic, that's when people took me seriously. So it, it took a long time coming and I just had to be patient. And there was literally nothing that I could do to make people feel better, but one thing that I can say right now is that my dinners are no longer one US dollars. So they're like <laughs> about 50, 60 US dollars. So wow, it's great. okay, we can, they can laugh at me, so it's okay. Yeah. Wow, that's yeah, truly amazing, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Persistence, persistence is a key, that's what I'm hearing. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Persistence and just not caring what other people think. As long as you're not hurting someone, and you're trying to make a change that's beneficial, then keep on pushing. Yeah. Thank you. 
Yeah. You're welcome. Jo Thank you, Chef Kola and Andrew. Joji. Yeah, hi, Chef Kola. It's great to hear your inspiring story, you know, uh, in what has to be very difficult circumstances in Africa. When we hear a lot about all this poaching and kidnapping and things like that. So my question is, how do you um, manage to stay, you, you and your park rangers manage to stay away from violence, you know, uh, from the clip that we saw, you know, the park rangers are going around with guns and things like that. Is there a possibility that the fact that they're armed might, uh, you know, give courage to the poachers to be violent themselves? I've heard these poachers are pretty ruthless. So I'm curious how you manage to um, stay away violence or, or if violence erupts, you know, how do you handle it? You had your park rangers that is. Thank you. Um, the antique poultry industry is like a billion dollar industry, literally. Um, whether you're working against it or for it, it's a billion dollar industry. And it's a very scary industry. For example, one of the rangers that was, um, and she's still there, she used to get arrested by her husband and the organization found out through internal investigations that her husband was actually a poacher. And when the husband found out that she's a poacher, he actually started being kind of physically violent towards her. And that was a security risk. But then the good thing about um, the IAPF is that A is headed by Damian Mander. This guy has years and years of international experience on war tactics, which is very important when you're going into the anti poaching And not only that, he acknowledges and he respects the fact that his knowledge on war tactics are um, Australian. They're not, or they, wherever he fought his wars, I don't know his military history in detail, but then he acknowledges the fact that this is Africa and we're operating in Zimbabwe and he works with the local government. He works with retired police, current police. He works with a lot of people, intelligence, um, in order to give the rangers the best training possible in order to protect themselves. I'm not saying that there haven't been a few incidents that happened. Those are normal causes or, or for any anti poaching organization but they have the best training that possibly I could say Africa has when it comes to anti-poaching. Um, so that's how they deal with it. They, we're a very close-knit family and they're very big on internal investigations. And yeah, that's how they deal with it. Just being prepared. <laughs> Thank you and all the best. Thank you. <laughs> Chef Kola, I have a question for you. You you started, you addressed this in your video, but I would just love to dig even deeper. You said that um, people ask you all the time, how did the rangers feel about adopting an entirely vegan diet? And 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 I and you talked about the um, the soy the soy chunks. Can uh, can you tell us more about that process of acclimating? the rangers to the type of cooking you were doing or vice versa you adopting their their uh, indigenous ingredients and their ways of cooking and just talk us through how did that process go how long did it go did they provide you with input how did you make that a success to be honest when i started cooking for them when i got into camp they hated my food. They threw it out into the bin immediately and they walked away saying some foul things. And wow. I grew up in New York City, but um, a lot of people don't think that I, I can speak my local language. So they were saying some things that, wow. And I had to understand that, okay, Chef Kola, you're trained in Cape Town. There's um, tofu and all of these beautiful things, but you need to take it back to the roots. You need to 
give them flavors and ingredients that they understand. So when I took it back to what they understand, that's when we sort of started meeting um, a middle ground. And it took, any change agent is not gonna be accepted in any organization, whether the change is good or bad. There's gonna be that one person who's gonna be like, no, 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 and influence those people to be like, we don't need this change. And when, before I came in, the organization, the Rangers were allowed to basically cook for themselves. And Damien would buy ingredients and the Rangers would come and cook for themselves. This had so many problems. The nutritional value wasn't being added. There was no stock control and other many issues. So it was literally just, like dealing with a toddler, like this is what's going to happen. Whether you like it or not, you either going to be a part of the program or you're not. Some people actually left and then they decided to come back when they realized that I'm not going anywhere. Like you're not going to go back to your old ways of cooking for yourself because you can't cook for yourself and then carry a gun and then carry water and then do this. Like it doesn't make sense. So it's been a process, but then it took me about a year to get them used to me and and then also a year to build a team because I had two chefs. One chef used to actually hunt on the concession. So he really didn't think I was going to last. And then the other chef was just like, well, I'm just, it, it's a paycheck. So it took a lot, <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. I, I just applaud you for your perseverance because it sounds like a really challenging, a challenge, challenging challenge. And yet you, you've persevered and we're so lucky. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And okay. I have, I have a, a question in terms of Chef Kola and uh, I love your, you know, your concept of going back to the roots, black roots. And in terms of the, the local villages that you're working in, in these rural villages, what percent of the, of the food that they, uh, are they able to grow in their, in their village? Um, most of the food they actually can grow. Okay. Uh, so there's enough rain to really be able to, to, su to sustain definitely. themselves from their local uh, they, produce rain, boreholes, and um, greenhouses. So we just go into the community and see if there's no rain, if there's no borehole for water, then we do greenhouse or we do any method that we can to survive within that community. So we tailor our needs for, be it the Zambezi Valley um, with IPF or be it um, Vuri with ProVeg, we just tailor whatever the situation is, um, we make a plan so that everything is plant-based. Cool. Great, fabulous. Thank you. oh, you're muted, Andrea. I'm sorry, yeah. Please uh, blurt out if anybody has any more questions. Not a question, but a comment. Uh, you know, when you mentioned uh, on Daniel Mander is Australian, it occurred to me that I might have seen him in another movie called Game Changers, right? Yeah, About yeah, uh, vegan. Sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. That that kind of uh, yeah. triggered my memory. So um, that's a good yeah. movie as well. I will check out Akashinga. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> and speaking of game changers, there's also another Chef Cole. I'm wondering if you've ever seen the uh, the documentary, The uh, Invisible Vegan. It's it's produced uh, here in the United States, and it's it's produced by um, African Americans for African Americans. It's a really excellent okay. first rate documentary. On definitely, I've seen it. Oh, I would love yeah. to do a documentary on veganism by Africans. Like, yes. that's just that. Yeah. Like, going back to indigenous um, roots, because not taken away from African Americans, but there's a step that they missed, um, which is us, the Africans. 
So, yeah. Well, well I think that they talked a, a, a good bit in that film about the the going back to their roots in Africa and, and you know, uh, being able to be really true to their African roots. Uh, being a vegan is much more true to your African roots than, than uh, eating fried chicken. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Yeah. We definitely don't have fried we didn't invent <laughs> fried chicken here. No, I wish we would no. have, but not. Nah. <laughs> yeah. Chef Cola, I would love to ask you more about the community because you're doing so much community empowerment. How has the community embraced what all of you are doing um with the the Akashinga Rangers, but also um, sharing the message of going back to to vegan roots. How have they embraced that? Do they do they understand it? Do they agree with it? Are they confused by it? How, what has been your experience? Um, the honest truth is that people are starving. We don't have food, and any solution to feed their families, they will embrace. And that's one thing that a lot of vegan organizations don't realize is that it's not about spreading the message to those who can aff afford your vegan products and the vegan lifestyle. It's about spreading your message to people who can't because that's where it's much needed. And once we bring in our vegan programs into these communities, they're super grateful because the first thing we do is that, or for me, is that I identify those who wanna be um, involved in, in the kitchen, I identify those who want to be gardeners, I identify those who want to be in, entrepreneurs, selling those vegetables that we're growing with the gardener, making connections, making a network, and basically building a community. So when I step into a community, people react in a very positive way because they actually see things in a different perspective, like, okay, not everything equals meat. Like, we don't actually have to wake up, eat meat, dinner, lunch, breakfast. And at the same time, we can actually um, become vegan entrepreneurs by growing vegetables, plant-based vegetables. We can't afford to take grow or herd animals because that takes, you gotta take it to the vet. You gotta make sure that there's clean water. It doesn't reproduce um, or grow as fast as a plant. So a lot of people are now going towards the plant-based diet. And, they receive it quite well once they understand it. They receive it better than people in urban areas because they're desperate. We're starving. We don't have food and we need answers and solution. And meat doesn't equal wealth. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah, really, really poignant. Thank you for clarifying that for us because at least for me, someone who has never been to Africa, I. I I can't uh, claim to know anything about the experience of someone living in a rural community. So I'm so grateful to, to you for educating us about that. That's really important for us to understand. Thank you. <laughs> it's, um, it's the top of the hour. Um, it's a little bit after three hour time, a little after 9 p.m. Chef Cola's time. Are there any other questions? Okay, I think that's it. Chef Cola, I cannot thank you enough. I am sure that everyone feels the same way. This was an outstanding uh, presentation, a marvelous experience. We are so happy to know you. Thank you for everything you are doing in the world. We are, as a, we, the world is so lucky to have you and we would really love to stay in touch and, and remain um, you know, abreast of everything that you're doing. Thank you so much guys for taking the time to listen to me. All of you, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for your work, Chef Paula. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank have you. a wonderful Bye. afternoon. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.